focus on leash monoiasis. This is on our program on uh, trypanosomiasis and, and tsetse flies and trypanosomes in general. And this is all about uh, something that uh, is being sort of uh, uh, discussed in this session, um, but not usually we think about drugs that will control bacterial transmission of any uh, entities, in particular this one, trypanosomiasis. So I just gonna want to share this story. And at the end, my colleague, Dr. Leith Jacob, uh, will uh, continue with this. So I think this audience doesn't need to uh, uh, much of this introduction, but just, we just to put things into context, we are in a great time where um, human African trypanosomiasis is about to be eliminated. So this is a, a projected uh, graph from WHO, from perhaps a little bit old, but uh, that was a, the projected number of cases and, and we're actually very close to it. Most of the cases are um, concentrated in, in few countries, in Democratic Republic of Congo and, and Uganda as well. And so this is um, on the verge to be uh, eliminated fairly soon, we hope. And that's the result of a combination of a better drugs, better and safer drugs, um, better diagnostics, tighter to control trams. So what will continue to be a problem uh, beyond having to control uh, human hamilton trypanosomiasis would be the animal trypanosomiasis situation because this is, uh, we still don't have solutions, we don't have vaccines, there is a lot of uh, drug resistance involved in that, and there is a great deal of uh, animal trips that are transmitted by other insects, not necessarily tsetse flies. So we need to come out with better and safer, better control tools for this. So what I'm going to talk about is in relation to something that is how we can exploit the physiology of the fly. And in this in this video made by uh, a Korean group uh, taken from our facility at the Liverpool School, you can see a safety fly landing on the producing arm to take a blood meal. And although this is fast forwarded, this process takes about 10 minutes, and within those 10 minutes, the fly takes up to 30 microliters of blood. So within that process, approximately, the, the fly expands twice its own volume. So this is quite remarkable. This is to think uh, a human weighing uh, 50 kilos will have in one go 100 liters of milk. So blood feeding insects do this, and do this for um, um, for several purposes, and, and but one of these to avoid visitation, so so they don't need to take a blood meal all the time. But also they have developed this, um, and in order to uh, um, they 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 have a developed fast digestion system in order to to really degrade all these uh, uh, products molecules contained in the blood meal. So um, a few years ago, um, this man um, Marcus Terkel, who at the time was a postdoc in the lab of Pedro Oliveira in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he was studying these particular um, aspects of blood feeding. And what he found is that for several arthropod vectors, he found that one molecule, one metabolite, tyrosine, that comes in the blood meal is essential for the life of those insects for different reasons. But he also found that when he does, um, when he blocks that pathway, either genetically or or pharmacologically, then the uh, the bugs die, or they have severely compromised the reproduction system. So um, Marcos came to to my group on several occasions. I did a fantastic job, and the idea was to whether the same approach to inhibit uh, uh, the tyrosine degradation pathway will work with glucina, and whether that then, as a, a academic concept, could be exploited in a more translatable way to control tsetse population in uh, endemic areas. We're not that far at the moment, but we think uh, this approach will have a strong potential. So this, this particular work just been published in PLOS Biology a few weeks ago, and involved not only Marcus's work, but also uh, a great job by Lee Haynes, a postdoc in the lab, and also several collaborators, uh, many to mention right now, but Leif at the end will mention, but uh, Leif Jacob, I did a great job into all this uh, mathematical modeling that I will explain um, in a few minutes. So um, I will just go, go through uh, several um, um, validation experiments that when we start with something from scratch 
and we need to know and just to make sure that will have the potential to be applied in the field. And one of those uh, first question is whether if we do genetic ablation of the genes involved in the tyrosine degradation pathway, would that have an impact in TETSI? So in order to do this, we did RNAi knockdown. So we injected double standard RNA into the thorax of TETSI fly, and we used two genes encoding for two important enzymes in that pathway, uh, TAT and HPPD in short. And when we did that, then compared to the control, which was just PBS injection, we see that there is a, a huge decline in, um, in days, oops. So days post injection, you can see that there is a decline in the survival of those flies. So that's a genetic validation that that pathway is essential for the fly when they take a blood meal and have the genes knocked down. Then we went to the pharmacological aspects of it. So we tried several inhibitors of the tyrosine uh, uh, degradation pathway. One of those is a, a very well-known herbicide produced by Syngenta, it's called Mesotrion. Mesotrion is a weed killer. Um, Syngenta sells millions uh, a year um, using this, this product. And what it does is to inhibit HPPD. Mesotrion uh, has effect, and I'm not gonna show this result, but the one that has actually at least 200 times more potent than Mesotrion is this one, it's Nitisinone. So Nitisinone is another one of these uh, uh, family of herbicides that in the 80s and early 90s was repurposed to treat one genetic disease that had no solution, that is tyrosinemia type 1. And this is a disease um, uh, that also affects the tyrosine metabolism pathway in babies. If these individuals don't take Nitisinone for the rest of their life, they die, basically. So this is being uh, this is FDA approved and it's being used uh, since then. There is another recent one, another um, disease called alcaptonuria. Uh, alcaptonuria is another metabolic disease uh, that has defects in the in the tyrosine metabolism pathway. And a group at the University of Liverpool, uh, led by Professor Ranga, they have worked out that nitisinone can also be used to treat this disease. And this has just been approved as for last for uh, last year. So uh, in order to then uh, how we can uh, uh, assess this in Glucina, um, well, so we had a, a we're very fortunate to have a large colony in our institution. So we just spiked the block mill with several concentrations of the drug. And what we found is that in a concentration dependent manner, we see a strong inhibition of the survival. So the basically death and, and even using um, up to 20 times lower concentration that are used in individuals that are affected by either tyrosinemia or uh, alcaptonuria. So in order to continue with this, then obviously the killer experiment was to uh, treat animals. So we treated animals uh, with the drug and then exposed them to the viral sexy fly. Uh, we used two different concentrations that are actually are matching what uh, are, are, are administered to humans uh, for these diseases, and we, we saw uh, uh, actually decline in a, in, a very in a very similar manner to what we see in artificial blood feedings. Another interesting aspect of this is that the drug could be used topically as an insecticide, so it's highly soluble in organic solvents, so for example, acetone, and when we do that, for example, when we apply the drug in the, um, to the fly, um, they don't die immediately, but the minute um, up to 144 hours at least, they can, they can, we, they receive a blood meal, they immediately die. So the death mechanism is active once they get exposed to the blood meal. So um, um, there are many things that uh, uh, obviously could be happening. We do understand, we want to understand this to understand potentially, well, the mechanism itself, but also potential resistant development. So using metabolomics with colleagues at the Crick Institute, we found, uh, we validated that this drug actually increases the level of tyrosine. So this is a time course of the experiment. So tyrosine gets uh, accumulated. Another metabolite, hydroxyphenol lactic acid, which is in human involving acidosis, uh, metabolic acidosis, is also highly um, increased. And then as a control, if we look at fumaric acid, which is one of the end products of this pathway, then after 10 hours, it gets completely shut down. So that is a biochemistry validation that we are um, uh, hitting the right uh, pathway. So what natisinone does to the fly, it does uh, many horrible things. 
it is tough a few hours with paralysis or it affects flying muscles, but then it leads to a systematic tissue destruction by um, inducing a systemic melanization of the insect. Um, in, the, in the meantime, there is a change in eye coloration, so they, the eye becomes golden. This is the uh, changes in coloration in the abdomen, as I said before, and also samples from uh, different places of the uh, uh, treated fly, fat body, and fly muscle. You can see the melanin session. This is only a few hours before they die. So one important aspect to this is that, as I said, this gets only activated by uh, when the, the, the insect gets in contact with blood, okay? Otherwise, um, that doesn't, doesn't happen. And, and importantly, we wanted to make sure that pollinators, like a mumble, uh, bumblebees, uh, they get affected, they don't get affected by the drug. And um, with these experiments in collaboration with the group of the University of Liverpool, and what we found is that when we expose uh, uh, bumblebees to different concentration, quite high, and, and those that induce, um, a killing phenotype directly in, in Tetsi, we see that compared to the PBS control, there is no effect uh, on those several days. So at least they don't induce death in, in pollinators, which is quite important. And this is unlike some, some of the neurotoxic insecticides that are or the children, whether they would affect in the reproductive system. This is a pending uh, experiment to do. So beyond uh, a tetsi control and for other entities, so would this concept will work for other uh, blood feeder insects? And the answer is yes. So we have tested this for uh, Anopheles and it worked uh, very well. And, and, and in fact, we're looking into those aspects. Um, our collaborators in Brazil, um, they, have, they had a paper, uh, a preprint paper that um, showing that it works for uh, Aedes aegypti, but also for local um, uh, an awful species affecting Brazil. Um, <clears throat> we have tested and not published yet the effects on phlebotomins. Um, again, our collaborators in Brazil have shown that ticks can, are also highly susceptible to the drug. So that means that, for example, in terms of veterinary use, if we treat uh, 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 animals in, in farms in Africa, for example, to control trypanosomiasis, that could also affect, for example, the local population of mosquitoes and ticks, because obviously they're constantly feeding on, on, on cattle as well. So just to summarize this before uh, Leith uh, uh, start with, the, uh, with his talk, we, we, we know that we I hope I'll be able to convince you that natisinum can be used to kill tetsi flies by inhibiting the tyrosine pathway. This drug can be uh, used, uh, it's ingested in a blood meal from um, host or, or topically or through the cuticle. So the, the, the cuticle aspect is very interesting as well and exploitable for many reasons. Um, the fact that they can be uh, ingested along the blood meal um, further develops this concept of uh, what is an endectocyte. And, and, and at the beginning, I wasn't really um, convinced to go on that route. But then a recent collaboration with um, Gaith Aliyuzi from the Liverpool School and, and with a PhD student from my group, Anna Tret, they have looked into the PKPD profiles of an atizinum in comparison, for example, with ivermectin, which is the gold standard, or we can see that an atizinum has a superior PKPD profile. Does that mean that it's a better drug? I don't think so. It's a, it's a long way to go, and, and we still have to um, sort out some problems potentially with toxicity. This toxicity have, um, comes from, from the fact that patients with tyrosinemia or acamptonuria, they have to uh, uh, take the drug on a daily basis, and, and so they have some, some of the consequence. But in terms of vector control approaches, we're looking into a single dose that um, will be compliant with the uh, uh, MMV uh, guidelines and, and will be used in combination with antiparasitic drugs as well. So this is uh, currently in preparation. So um, this um, approach, as I said, it could be used as an integrated vector control package because it will also affect other blood feeding insects. And importantly, it's eco ecologically friendly because um, uh, at least we demonstrated it doesn't kill uh, pollinators. So um, an important aspect of this work as well is uh, whether that might, be, um, that might work in the field. In the case of trypanosomiasis, for example, African trypanosomiasis, we got that two different um, parasite species 
uh, that are transmitted by two different glossina species and in different ecological situations are responsible for sleeping sickness, although the Gambiense one obviously is the most important one. So that's when uh, the important work of uh, my colleague Jacob uh, into looking into this mathematical model in the field and also um, um, to validate whether this approach um, uh, can be used. Um, so I will leave now, I will stop uh, sharing and leave this with uh, Leith's uh, presentation. Hello, I'm Leith Jacob and I work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, I'm here to talk about some of the modeling work we did to complement the lab work produced by Alvaro and colleagues on nitazinane. And I just wanted to share this picture with you. This is a, a sculpture outside the Keppel Street building of the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. So the next time you come to the London School, um, please do keep an eye out for it. It's a sexy fly. So the way that we conducted the modeling was by using a, a Ross McDonald equation. Um, and many people will be familiar with Ross McDonald for vector borne disease modeling. It's been used predominantly for understanding malaria transmission, but it's equally applicable to most vector borne diseases. And at its simplest, it is R0, which is the basic reproduction number, um, as derived from five key parameters. And they are M, which is the number of flies per person, A, which is the daily bite rate. And it's squared because there are two bites required for the pathogen to complete its life cycle. P to the N is the probability of surviving N days. R is the recovery rate and mu is the fly mortality rate. So for example, if you wanted to simulate larval control, the way that you would do that would be by reducing M. So you reduce the number of flies per person and that reduces R0. If you wanted to simulate treating the sick, way to do that is by increasing the recovery rate. So you increase little r and it's in the denominator and so that reduces the overall r naught. Now for almost 100 years people have appreciated that killing adult vectors is normally the way to go and the way, the way we understand that is because when you kill adult vectors you have a multiplicative impact on multiple parameters. So for in this circumstance, we're not just reducing the flies per person, M, but we're also reducing the probability of surviving N days, which is PN. And we are increasing the fly mortality rate again in the denominator. So you have this multiplicative impact on transmission. Taking the efficacy data from Alvaro's work and also the, the, the longevity of its efficacy, and it's the half-life of nitazanine and its efficacy, for example. We plug that into a simple Ross McDonald model to um, inform its, its impact. And, and this plot is just showing the RE this time. RE is the effective reproduction number, which is just the basic reproduction number but under interventions. Um, on the y-axis, we have RE, and on the x-axis, we have time in days. And this is just a simple um, simulation of monthly dosing. So with monthly doses, we get a, a, a drastic decrease in the reproduction number followed by a gradual increase where uh, re-equilibrates at its equilibrial level, pre-control um, equilibrial level. And you get these characteristic monthly pulses of uh, RE. And the different lines are just simply denoting uh, different efficacy levels or different coverage levels, actually, different coverage levels. So one of the, the nuances of, of sexy flies is that they are really inconsistent with where they source their blood meals from. So depending on where the study was conducted or how it was conducted or when it was conducted, um, the majority of blood meals sourced by sexy flies can uh, have rat origins or it can come from bats sometimes or wild, other wildlife species. Um, some sexy fly biting behavior studies have identified humans and livestock as the, as the sources of, of most blood meals. And the reason why I thought it was important to incorporate this kind of nuance is that whilst it's um, 
feasible to dose livestock and even human blood meals uh, or human blood with vitacinine and TBC. Um, it has FDA approval for use in humans. It's less feasible probably to get that drug into the blood of wildlife. And so we needed to account for that. And the way that we did that was we simulated um, all the possible combinations of blood meals. There is a split between livestock, humans, and wildlife uh, un under the assumption that we would never be able to get the, the, the drug into wildlife blood. So here, here we have some simulation results looking at dosing livestock. Only on the y-axis, we have the proportion of bites on livestock. So at the bottom, no bites on livestock, and at the top, all bites of sessi flies go onto livestock. Um, on the x-axis, we have the proportion of bites on humans. Again, zero means no biting on humans, and one means all bites are on humans. And so, for example, where we have 0.2 bites on humans, 20% of bites is on humans, and 20% of bites on livestock, that necessarily means that the other 60% of bites is happening on, on wildlife, and we can do nothing about that. Now, we have three plots here, and they are demonstrating what happens when you treat livestock every 10 days, in the middle every 30 days, and on the right every 90 days. And the color is corresponding with the effective reproduction number. So the brown regions is where we are failing to break transmission, where the effective reproduction number is remaining above one. And you can see when we have very frequent dosing, so in the order of every 10 days, and provided that at least 20% of the blood meals have livestock origins, then we are actually able to break transmission just using this as a standalone control strategy. But again, at very high frequency. So the equivalent plots for dosing humans, um, it's better for breaking transmission. And in this circumstance, when um, at least 20% of the blood mills have got human origin, you only need to dose humans every 30 days in order for you to break transmission. And then as you might expect, if you can dose both livestock and humans, and provided at least five to 10% of your blood meals have got human or livestock origins, then you can um, enter this white or blue region here um, and you can break transmission. So that's an encouraging result. So very quickly to conclude, we feel that host targeting needs to be informed by local ZC fighting behavior if locals I see are sourcing the majority of their bites from um, wildlife that you can't drug, then this is not a viable control option, probably. We need to emphasize the point that the current half-life of mitazanine is quite short, and that constrains this, massively constrains the sustainability of, of this. Um, we don't envisage NTBC treatment to be a standalone control tool to, to eliminate uh, transmission. Uh, we envisage it to form part of an integrated control to achieve elimination. So in the final stages of achieving elimination, um, if you're struggling to break transmission, then NTBC could be a, a good complementary tool to use. And I think it was the general conclusion of the most recent WHO, WHO meeting of stakeholders on the elimination of Gambian C that an integrated approach using novel vector control tools such as this is the best hope that we have of eliminating HAT. And with that, I just want to acknowledge all our fellow collaborators and co-authors on this, on this huge endeavor. And thank you very much for listening.